Hi everyone, today I wanna to talk about an exciting feature in Haskell called Coercible. Um, this, this feature, I think, is one of the, the sort of unsung heroes of Haskell. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the, it's one of the things that when, whenever anyone sort of comes to me and says, oh, you know, why are you bothering adding uh, dependent types to Haskell? Just, just go and use Idris. Well, Coercible is one of the things that Haskell does really, really well, in my opinion. And, and because of that, um, uh, it's, it's one of the reasons that we want to continue to build on Haskell. There's, a, there's plenty of other reasons, but this is really something I think doesn't necessarily deserve or, or get as much airtime as it deserves. The idea is in, in Haskell that when you make a new type, the new type has the exact same representation as the original type. So what do I mean by that? So if I make new type, whoops, I can't type new type. Um, if I make new type age equals some constructor int, now it means that the type age and the type int are completely indistinguishable at runtime. Um, but because age is considered a separate type from it at compile time, we can still write instances for age that are different than those for int and, and do other manipulations. If we don't export the makeAge constructor, then that also means that um, uh, that age can be considered abstract. So maybe we want to do some validity checking that age is, I don't know, between 0 and 120. I think 120 is as far as the human race has made it so far. Um, so, so, uh, but we could have that kind of validity checking, and then we could be sure as we go into age, as we, uh, um, uh, here, I can even just write the function, to age, int to age, and then to age if um, 0 is less than or equal to n, and n is less than or equal to 120, that equals mook age of n, otherwise error bad age. So, so this, is, this is terrible, we're using error, this is very, you know, we're magic numbers in here, this is terrible on many grounds. But we can see the, the, the appeal of having some kind of abstract type age. So this is useful uh, for new types. What coercible is about is coercible allows you at compile time in the type system to observe this runtime correspondence between age and int. Um, so instead of saying mcage here, I could just say coerce n. So at first that's not going to compile because coerce is not in the preview. So we need to import data.coerce. And then now this works. So what coerce does is, let's look at the type for coerce to understand it better. Um, so for any two types A and B that are coercible, coerce coerces from one to the other. It is guaranteed to be fully erasable at runtime. That means that whenever I use coerce like this, where well, I'm not going to spend any time. By the time I generate my code, this coerce is completely gone. So if it just replaced a new type constructor, that wouldn't be all that interesting. And by the way, it can go in both directions. So I can write from age, age to int, and then just say from age equals coerce. Um, but it can also do other things. Uh, before we move on to those other things, I, I should note, I was talking earlier about abstraction. Does this violate abstraction? No, this kind of coercion through a new type like this only works when the new type constructor is in scope. You're just gonna have to take my word on that. I don't feel like creating a whole other module just to demonstrate that one thing. But if mic age is not exported, if it's not in scope, then this, this, both of these coerces would, uh, would fail to type check. Um, so just this, wrapping and unwrapping a new type, it's kind of useful because it means we don't have to remember the name of the new type constructor, but it's not all that useful, really. What, what's very useful, though, is the fact that coerce can work with other data types, too. So instead of to age and from age like this, I could say to ages. And this could go from a list of int to a list of age. Um, and now let's sort of drop this, this premise of, of having these abstraction barriers and let's just look at what coerce can do. So two ages, I can implement that via coerce. So here I'm transforming a whole list of int to a list of age. And I can do that by taking no action at runtime at all. And that's because I know that int and age have the same representation. Um, and, and this, this continues to, to expand. So um, uh, let's have another function. We can frob an either bool age to an either bool int. And I can implement frob by coerce. So here I have a rather complex data type. Um, but I know if I'm just changing it from one new type to another, that I can just coerce. We can also do this with multiple levels. If I have multiply, multiply wrapped new types, um, I, I can do that. So if I have another new type, we'll just call it age two, whoops, equals mc age two around age. 
Now, my frog can go from age two to int. I can even go in both directions at the same time. Right? We don't have to think carefully about what either is and do a whole lot of pattern matching. We just say coerce. This is easier to write, and I know that it will have no impact at runtime, that it will be speedy. So that's really nice. Um, so there are some dark corners of this. And so maybe some of you out there have heard about role annotations. And so let's talk a little bit about role annotations, because as much as it's exciting to be able to do all of this, it's not always a good idea. So for example, let me import data.set here. And then now, suppose I have a set of age. And in fact, I'd rather treat this as a set of int. Can I write change set equals coerce? Ah, no, I cannot. And so we get an error here, couldn't match type age with int. And the reason it doesn't work for set even though it works for all these other things, is because when we declared set, or when the library declared set, um, it had a role annotation. So let's sort of explore a little bit about what's going on here. Age is a separate type from int. That means that age can have, for example, a different ORD instance than int does. Um, so in fact, if you watch the deriving via, uh, uh, video from a few weeks ago, we see that I can write here Let's see a new type age. We're just going to look at age for a sec. So I could say deriving um, new type eek. So I'm going to use the new, generalized new type deriving to get the eek instance. But my ORD instance is going to be via not int, but down int. Maybe I want ages to be sorted in an opposite order from ints. Um, so if I try to compile this, oh, then something about deriving strategies. And then I'm sure we're going to get other things after that. We need deriving via. Um, oh, now that's not in scope. That's in data.ord if memory serves. OK. Oh, um, what's this? No, oh, no instance for eek age. What? Huh? No, but I say deriving eek. What's the problem here? Oh, can't make a derive instance of, oh, I need generalized new type deriving generalized new type deriving. I think that's the longest extension name, actually. Um, OK, so now we're back down here. Um, and, and so now, with all of this stuff up here, what I've done is the, is the ORD instance for age is backward from that for int. So let's comment out this bad code just so I can demonstrate what I mean by this. So if I have mook age 5, is that less than mook age of 10? Well, no, it's not, because I've switched the order of the ORD instance. Now let's get back to this set thing here. So internally, a set uses a sort of a glorified binary search tree. It's not quite binary because we can do a little bit more efficiently than that, but we can pretend this is a binary search tree. And in a binary search tree, right, the elements on the, uh, the left children are less than uh, the right children. But this idea of less than depends on the ORD instance for the element type of the set. And so that means that a set age would actually store its information differently than a set int. If I try to change a set age to a set int via coerce like this, that would be bogus. And now lookups in my set would fail unpredictably because the ORD instance has changed. So for this, in the data.set in, in the data.set library, there is what's called a role annotation on set. So let's just pretend I have set here. So I'm going to define it locally. Um, and my, my internal representation is just going to be a list. Obviously, I could do much better, but I'm not going to be so concerned about that right now. If I just write this, and then I have all these functions that construct sets and look sets up, maybe even this list, let's say it's an ordered list to sort of keep this dependency on ord. Um, now, let's change my local set instead of the imported one. Um, so now, this compiles just fine, because for all I've said, all a set is is, is just like a list, and so coerce will work. The representation at runtime of this local set um, of age is the same as set into this makes sense. The problem is, is that the way I'm going to use this set, so let's, for example, we can have min element uh, set a to a. Um, and then here, this maybe gets the first element. And then we'll need something else. For the other case, OK. Um, so here, the fact that this is the min element from my set, the only reason it's the min element is because I've stored them in order. 
right? And so now if I use min element, changing a set age to a set int, this min element would actually get me the max element. This would be very, very bad. So because of this, what I would do with set is here, I would write type role um, uh, set nominal. Uh, so, okay, I need to turn on role annotations. Let, see, let me do that, role annotations. And now we get the error that we should get, can't match age with int. So what does this type role set nominal mean? So first we have a little prefix here, type role. That's just what we say when we're about to, to write a role annotation. Then we have the name of the type here. And then I have to give here what role I want for each argument. So set only has one argument, but if it had two, I could write nominal. And then the next, the other uh, interesting role is representational. There's also one called phantom. We'll return to that in just a sec. Um, but here I only have one argument and I want it to be nominal. So what nominal here means is that the name uh, name relates to, to nominal in English, that the name of the type is what matters. So the fact that age and int have the same runtime representation, that doesn't matter. What matters is that they have different names. And so because they have different names, then set age is a different type. It is not coercible to set int, even though actually at runtime they have the same representation. And so because I've written type role set nominal, it means that the name matters. And the reason, again, that the name matters is that there would be invariance on this set uh, that, that the list is in non-decreasing order, right? So if we have an invariant on a data type that refers to a type class according to ORD, um, it, then what we really need is we need a nominal role on that type parameter to make sure that no one does anything naughty like changing set age to set int. Um, so these role annotations, these are sometimes a little obscure to, to, to think about, but really important if users of your library, right, if you're writing a library, if users of your library might use coerce, and they might, then you want to think about this every time you have a class-based invariant. So there are other times that we can't do a coercion. Um, so I'll just show one last example here. Oh, uh, um, sorry, I said I'd talk about phantom. Phantom is for things that are, uh, for type variables that are completely unmentioned. So if I have data fant a equals mcfant, but I don't then say anything further, well, actually now change fant. Uh, I can write fant int goes to fant bool. And then the implementation of change fant is just going to be coerce. Oh, this isn't going to work because of my change set. Let's comment that out. And then this compiles just fine, even though int and bool aren't related at all. But GHC observes that this isn't used at all. So this has a phantom role. So if I wanted to write a redundant role annotation for fant, I could write this. Um, and, it, and it's redundant. So when we write a role annotation, it, uh, uh, GHC actually checks to make sure that we're not doing something that's actually against the rules. So I couldn't label this one as phantom because the A actually is used. So here we would say a role mismatch um, on, on variable A because I've written phantom, but actually it needs to be at least representational. That's sort of the default role, which means that I don't have any class constraints, but actually this, um, that, that set age is the same as set int. So that's sort of the default one. But let's go back to nominal, which is the right one here. Um, so this last example that I wanted to show is about a GADT. Um, so if we imagine a data GA where mcg1 is gAge and mcg2 is gint. And now if I have a function f that takes a gAge to, I don't know, to bool, doesn't really matter. And then I pattern match mcg1 equals true. This pattern match is actually complete. Right? I can't have mcg2 because a mcg2 has type gint. So those of you who watched my, my videos on Gadgets saw this, and we would see here that, oh, illegal, blah, 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 gats. Okay, and even if I turn on, whoa, maybe we'll get other errors here. Oh, redundant imports. Let me just uh, get rid of that. I think that should probably be the only one. Um, so even with, with turning warnings on, there's no other possible equation for f because mcg2 is eliminated. But, but if I could change g, if I could convert a g int into a g age by use of coerce, then suddenly my pattern match wouldn't really be complete anymore, right? Because then I could call change g on mcg2 and pass that to f. 
right? That looks type correct here, and yet it would fail in my, in my pattern match in F. So the solution here is that GHC doesn't allow this kind of coercion. When we write a GADT, GHC says, ah, oh, this A here, this really has to be nominal. Anything other than nominal is going to be wrong. Um, so there's a whole process called role inference that figures out what the, ro the correct role is. And so role inference tells us that on G here, the role should be nominal. On FANT, the role should be phantom. Role inference says on set that the role should be um, representational, but actually we change it here with, with an explicit role annotation to be nominal because of this class-based invariant. Um, okay, so what have we learned here? We've learned that coerce is this powerful mechanism that allows us to change types from one thing to another, um, as long as those two types have the same runtime representation. But of course, in a language like Haskell, with all of its fun type level things, there are weird corner cases and weird exceptions. And so to handle these, we have these role annotations. The other big thing to, to walk away from this is, is that if you're ever writing a type and it has a class-based invariant, make sure to write a role annotation. Thanks very much for watching. Hope this has been interesting. Bye.